Hey, Nerdy Knitters, welcome to another edition of the Knitting 411 podcast, where we discuss your knitting questions and find you some knitting answers. Today, we've got a lot to talk about. I'm going to share a few of the things I'm working on. Mostly, it's things for the Master Knitting program. I'm working on level three and finishing up my final few projects. We're also going to discuss one of your questions about that pesky knit to pearl transition, where sometimes that knit stitch is really enlarged just before things like cables and rib. We'll talk about that and a few ways you can try to fix that if that is an issue for you. And we're going to look at one more, actually two more different ways to construct sleeves in a sweater. We've covered all the different ways and we're wrapping up that discussion today by talking about saddle shoulder sleeves and also dolman sleeves, something that's probably not as common, but still fairly popular in a few different methods. So we're, we've got a lot to talk about today, but let's start with some knitting news. There's been some interesting things happening in the world. Last week was the Met Gala, last Monday, in New York City. This is an event that's organized by Vogue, and it's an annual fundraiser for the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Costume Institute. And you probably have seen lots of pictures of all of the pretty dresses and costumes. But one that really stood out to me and I saw in many knitting groups this past week was the dress worn by Sandra Jarvis Weiss. Her husband, Daniel Weiss, is the CEO of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And she wore a gown, you can see a quote there about the designer. And there's a link, you'll find the link down in the description box um, that explains her design process and about her as a designer. And you can see some close up pictures of this dress. Now, this dress is a wool dress that she designed, but it's not just wool. She's sourced exclusively from American farms and all of those little baubles and beads and that floral neckline. She uses rare indigenous and endangered breeds of sheep as well. So it's a really interesting dress. And so knitting got a bit of a spotlight at the Met Gala this week, which I thought was very interesting. So you can go to that link um, and read more about that. So if you're joining me, why don't you pop in and say hi in the chat and tell me what's on your knitting needles this week. And if you saw any interesting wool related or knitting related news, you can leave that too. And I love to see things out in the world that pertain to us. And I thought it was really neat to see that dress at the Met Gala, it was really pretty. So go to that link and you can see some close ups of the dress itself and some of that floral detail and the wool that was used and more about the design process. The designer has a link to her Instagram page on there so you can check out more about that. So now I'm going to talk about what I've been knitting and I have been working on my master level three. I've finished my hat and I am in the process of working on my sweater and also the patterns to go along with them. So I'm gonna to switch to my knitting camera and show you a close up of those. Here is my hat. I call it my cherry on top hat because to me it looks like a whipped cream and cherry sitting on the top like you would see on an ice cream sundae. So there's the, you can still see, I've got lots of things to finish up here, all of those ends need to be woven in. Now, I know one method for weaving in ends is to weave them in as you go, which I use quite a bit. But for this project, where it's my final exam, basically, for the Master Hand Knitting Program, I want it to be as done nicely as possible. And I knew that if I wove them in as I went, sometimes they can peek through and I really didn't want that to happen. So I thought I would save them and deal with them all at the end. So. I've already washed and blocked it. And after I weave in the ends, I'm probably going to do that again because you can see the seam line right there. And I'm hoping I can adjust that and fix it a bit as I'm weaving in the ends. But I did a corrugated rib. I had three yellow colors, three shades of yellow that I used for my background colors. And then I had three shades of blue that I used for the pattern colors and I used those here in the rib as well. And then I used red and white for a little pop of color. I think I've talked in um, past episodes about choosing the colors. I wanted something fairly simple since I couldn't see the colors in person, I had to order them online. So I did have, um, I used Knit Picks Fingering, their uh, Knit Picks Palette, their fingering weight wool yarn. 
Um, and they do have, I don't have it out where, where I can show you, but um, a whole folder that shows all of the colors. So I had ordered one of those so I could at least get a really good idea of what the colors would look like beforehand. And then I decided on yellow and blue to have a good contrast. And then I just chose three sort of grady, gradient shades of each. And then I added white as my neutral and then red as the other primary color as another pop of color in there. So then there's the ribbing. And then right here is in this section is where I increased for the full width of the hat. Then I have this little border pattern and that is where my blocking line is. I blocked it on a plate to give it the shape. And then this is the top. I worked the decreases right in there, right in that spoke design. And then one of the issues I had had was I my pattern wasn't lined up and I wanted the the motifs to sort of line up. So like the middle of the that X would be right in the middle of that decrease line. So the la the first prototype hat I worked that wasn't lining up, but it lines up properly now. And then I really like um, Norwegian stars, which I guess aren't technically fair isle, but there's a lot of crossover in some of the patterns. So I put those up at the top and then a few little smaller motifs just to fill in the space. So I wouldn't have a lot of gaps in there. So my hat is finished. I'm really happy with how it came out. Um, I do see some mistakes and stretched out stitches here and there, but I think overall it looks really good. So after I get it woven in and those ends all done and blocked one more time, that will be all ready to go. I just have to finish writing up the pattern, which is really easy because it's a chart mostly. And then just like just one paragraph of written instructions and this is a really great affordable yarn, Knit Picks palette, and there are so many colors available and it's perfect for color work projects. Um, actually, I have a ton, I have, you can see I've got so much left here and this is after knitting, I don't know, three or four swatches, two full hats. I still probably have at least half a skein of each left. So I have decided, I'm trying to figure out what to do with the leftovers. I wanna save some in case I have to knit my hat again, but fingers crossed I won't have to do that. So my daughter had um, ordered this book for me. It's in Japanese, um, but she collects these little, they're called Nendroid dolls, and they're these tiny little figures. And they have this, this knitting book that was released. They've got a few in the series, I think. Um, so she marked some of the things that she would like to have, these tiny, tiny little outfits. And most of them are done with fingering and even lace weight yarn. So lots of cute little things in there. So you can see as scale, there's like a full size, a normal teapot and a teacup, and that's the size of these dolls. They're that small. So I thought with a lot of these leftovers, I might knit up some of these little projects for her and put, set them aside to put in her Christmas stocking this year. But I do have to sit down because all of the, let me see if there's the instructions. And if I don't read Japanese, I do love how they chart everything out. I think that's so interesting. They basically have very short instructions and then everything you need to know is written on the chart, which I thought was really neat. And sometimes I tend to do that if I'm knitting a sweater that's not too difficult. I can put all the instructions right on the schematic and just follow that instead of having to read the whole pattern. But I am going to have to... Um, get a picture of this and translate it. My daughter showed me how I can translate it using Google Translate, so that will help. And that will be the next thing I'll be working on in my spare time, because I am still working on my other final project. I'm finishing, we have two projects we have to do. We have to do an Aaron, uh, an Aaron project and a hat. Uh, or oh, well, an errand project and a stranded knitting project. And we have our choice whether one of them has to be a sweater and one of them has to be a hat. So since I did my stranded knitting hat, my sweater has to be an errand cable sweater. So this is the beginnings of it. It's not all gonna fit in here once. This is the back of the sweater. I've started it already. I've got my chart going and I just finished one repeat of the pattern. That motif is the center panel. And this is the right side and then the left side. So this is going to be for my daughter. She wanted like an oversized drop shoulder. 
sweater and it's going to have saddle shoulders which we're going to talk about today and discuss more about that and saddle shoulders are really common because it's hard to match up your motifs when you're putting the front and the back together and seaming them it can be difficult to get like these cables to match up properly so a saddle can be used to sort of separate the front and the back and you can work a separate design in there and it doesn't look so obvious that transition like you, you use that saddle and you seam the front and the back to that instead. So that is in progress right now and coming along nicely. I did have one mistake on this. I had not done this cable crossing properly. There's actually it's five stitches. There's two that cross to the left, two that cross to the right and there is a purl stitch right in the middle and I had not been crossing them properly, so I had to drop down and fix this whole thing. I didn't want to take the whole thing out because I'd finished up to about here, I think. So I just, I figured out how to drop down and just fix those stitches right there. So that, and, oh, and the yarn I'm using for this one is also no, another Knit Picks yarn. I really like Knit Picks. I find their yarns really affordable. And they have a lot of different varieties and I really prefer wool for a lot of projects and they have really good affordable wool. So this I'm using their bare worsted yarn because my daughter, she wants like a dark navy sweater and we can't submit something that's really dark because it's hard for the reviewers to really see your work. So I told her we would do it in a bare yarn and then after it comes back and it's been accepted and passed, then we can dye it any color she likes. So that was the easiest choice. So this is a worsted weight yarn um, and it's Peruvian Highland wool. So it's, I mean, it feels like wool. It's not super scratchy, but I wouldn't want to wear it right against my skin. I'd probably wear a t-shirt or something underneath it just so you're not feeling scratchy at all. But it's a nice, nice, nice wool yarn. There, so that is everything that I've been knitting. Now, before we switch cameras, I will show you, I love to show you knitting resources and books. So we will take a quick look at one right now. This one just came from the library and I haven't even had a chance to really sit down and look at it yet, but I flipped through really quickly and it's so cute. It's got some adorable things in here. If anybody's watched The Mandalorian and the, the baby Yoda, as everybody likes to refer to him, I can't remember his name, is it Grogu, I think? Well, there he is with his little mug, if it's Grogu. I'm not sure if it is or not. And a lot of other Star Wars-inspired things in this book. It's very cute. This is a book by Tannis Gray. She has, I think, two Harry Potter books as well. So if you're a nerdy knitter, then these might want to be on your shelf. And even the, the introductory pages are very, very cute. So the patterns are divided up into a few sections. There are some toys, that's where you'll find that Yoda, and there's a little Death Star and a Chewie. Chewie was right there too. He's very cute. So for your little ones who love toys. And then there are some replicas from the movie itself. Um, Padme's battle wrap, Ray's vest and arm wraps, Princess Leia's Hoth snow vest, Luke Skywalker's flight vest. So if you have somebody who likes to cosplay, then those are some great things that they could you could add to their cosplay wardrobe. And then there's a great section of inspired apparel, things that are inspired by the show, but not direct or the movies and but not directly from them. Yoda mitts and mittens, Wookiee socks, Darth Vader pullover. And there are even some home decor items. So BB-8 fans, there's a throw and then a pillow set and mini sweater ornaments. Oh, I wanna see those. Let's flip to that one. Since it is, I'm thinking about Christmas knitting already. Anybody else thinking about Christmas knitting? What's your knitting for little projects? Okay, so mini sweater ornaments, aren't those cute? Okay, now these are all I can't, that would be a lot of little stranded knitting. Let me see what, oh, it's using duplicate sti stitches. Using duplicate stitching added after the knitting. So the sweaters are top down with traditional raglan increasing. And then you add those cute designs after. So that's really adorable, I think. So here's some of the costume replicas. 
Luke's flight vest. And there's Ray's vest and arm warmers. That could be a popular cosplay thing to wear. Let me see. And this scarf, oh, this is really nice. Let me see, this is, this is double knit, a double knit scarf. So you'll see lots of different techniques in here. Duplicate stitch, double knitting, tie fighter hat and mittens. Now this one does probably look like either maybe mosaic or stranded. Let me see, slip stitch color work pattern. Yeah, so that's a slip stitch design. So that would be one color at a time. You wouldn't be having to juggle multiple colors across a row. So that could be a good introduction to color work. So there's lots of fun things in this book. There. <clears throat> Let me grab a quick drink. All right, so that covers what I've been knitting and a new resource to show. Her Harry Potter books are really cute. Well, I've seen the first one. I haven't seen the second Harry Potter book, but Tannis Gray, she's got the, the Star Wars book and two Harry Potter books. So if you're a fan of those, then you might want to check your library to see if they, they have them. I know they're on Amazon. I've linked this book down in the video description box so you can find that. Okay, so let's See what we've got going on here. All right, our community question. Every week we like to, I like to ask you a question that you can answer over on the community page of the YouTube, the Nerdy Knitting YouTube channel. And the question I posted last week was asking about your first knitting project. So if you're here in the, in, watching this live, why don't you just pop it right in a comment? Tell me what your first knitting project was. Mine was a very terrible dishcloth, one of those corner to corner where you do the yarn overs, the classic heirloom, grandma's favorite that comes by a lot of different names. That was my first project and my tension was so tight that it doesn't come to a point. That first point, it's like sort of curved. It was really, really terrible. But I've since improved since then, that's for sure. So if you haven't answered that question, you can go ahead, tell us about your first knitting project. And we had a lot of submissions telling me about their projects. We've got a lot of hats which I thought was great. People jumped right into knitting in the round as their first knitting project. And we've got some scarves and cowls, um, wrist warmers. That's another one that I thought was really interesting. So we'll dive right into our questions. We only had one question submitted this week and it was about, um, let me see, here it is. No, ma um, no matter what I try, my transition from a knit to a purl is always messy, especially ribbing or cables. I've tried purling through the back loop, wrapping the yarn the other way, and also giving the yarn a little tug before I complete the first purl. What am I doing wrong or do I just need to practice? Oh, this is a big one because this is a very, very common problem for a lot of people. Now, there's a reason it happens, and we'll get to the demonstration in a minute, but if you think about when you're knitting, when you form the knit stitch, the yarn's always staying in the back of the work. But when you bring, when you have to purl, you have to bring the yarn forward. And that adds some excess yarn. And if you're just doing it like moving along and not thinking about it and you're moving it loosely, then you've got a lot of excess in there. And that excess yarn works it with its way back to that final, the knit stitch, that knit stitch just before the purl. And that's when you end up with that, what they call that enlarged row of purl or enlarged knits before purl. And this can happen, it's really common to see it in rib patterns. This is why you'll often see patterns written where you work the rib on needles two sizes smaller. This is one of the reasons why that's done. It's also to make it a little bit tighter, um, but it's done to mask that effect of moving back and forth between the needles where that excess yarn builds up in those knit stitches. You'll also see it in cables. I've got a little sample here to show you about that, where that that's last knit stitch before the purl when you're working a cable that gets enlarged too. It can happen in seed stitch or any pattern where you're moving back and forth between knits and purls. It's that one movement, not usually happening when you go from purl to a knit, but that movement from you're knitting a stitch and then you bring that yarn forward to purl a stitch. Something about that movement causes that excess yarn to build up and create that enlarged stitch. 
So there are things we can try, and I've listed a few here, and she said that she tried these things already, but we're going to discuss them in case you haven't tried them and this is an issue for you, and some other things that you might be able to try as well. But before we do that, I did want to mention Suzanne Bryan. She's here on YouTube. She's got lots of really helpful knitting tutorials and videos. I remember her talking about how she did a survey of her local knitting guild to see who had this issue. Almost everybody did. So she brought yarn. Everybody had the same exact yarn, but they each had their own needles. If I'm getting my story correct, I hope I am. You can look. She's got videos about this topic, too, about transitioning from knit to pearls and how to fix that that enlarged stitch. Um, so she had everybody there knit a swatch and then they checked. Um, I'm not sure how they knit it. I think they must have done like a row in a different color or something and then and then measured the lengths of yarn for each row to see which row was large because obviously larger stitches are going to use more yarn. That's also something you can try on your own. There's a few things you can do but we'll we'll get to that. So anyway they checked this and she discovered with this small group, obviously, it wasn't a large, like 100 person survey, but a smaller survey of people, all of the knitters who knit with the yarn in their right hand, which we often refer to as English or throwers, things like that. If basically, you're holding the yarn in your right hand. It was their purl stitch that was enlarged. But those who knit what they would say continental or with the yarn in their left hand, it was actually the knit stitch that was larger and not the purl stitch. A lot of times you'll see books and resources mention that it's always the knit stitch or the purl stitch that's too large, but that's not necessarily the case. It can change depending on how you knit. So that's one thing to think about is which stitch is actually causing the problem. Are you knitting too loosely or are you purling too loosely? It might not actually be the purl stitch. It could be the knit stitch. For me, I am a continental knitter and it was actually the knit stitch that was more, that was looser than the purl stitch. And I discovered this, I knit a swatch in stockinette. So I was knitting one row, then purling the next and then knitting a row and then purling. But I would mark my, my purl rows because I assumed that was the issue. And then after I had knit like four inches, I just left it on my needles, but I flipped it over because one of the things you can look for to see if this is a problem is that rowing out. This, I'm gonna switch to the knitting camera so you can see what I'm talking about here. One of the things that you can look for when you're knitting or purling is those sections where you have lines. You can see some right along here. This is where it's referred to like rowing out. Um, where there's excess space between your, your rows. You can see there's some this right along here. I don't think I have too many of them in the middle, but if you look at it there, you can see how light along these edges, some of those, there's a little extra space between some of my rows. And that's referred to as rowing out. So as you knit a swatch, you can check and see where that's happening. Is it happening beneath a row where you knit or is it happening beneath a row that you've purled? And that will give you a clue about whether your stitch, which stitch is actually bigger. And <clears throat> then you can use that information to determine what you should do to fix it. So we'll look at those first few fixes. Well, here's the issue right here in a cable. You can see this, this column right here of stitches is a lot bigger than the other stitches in that cable. So the excess yarn from purling here, that went over back to this stitch. And you can just see it's just much larger than the other stitches. And it happens in ribbing. If you look at this column right here, it's not so noticeable, but this second column is bigger. It's a little more noticeable there. This second column of stitches is bigger. And that's because of that, that transition. So one, we'll look first at those few things that you can do. The biggest thing is you wanna keep your tension for your other stitches as even as possible. Let me just knit a few over. Um, all right, so you wanna knit with your normal tension on your knit stitch, first knit stitch. And then that knit stitch that's just before, you're going to knit it normally, but then when you bring the yarn to the front, give it a little pull. 
and that tightens that up a little bit. And you're gonna keep this yarn tight as you knit this purl stitch. And then the important thing here is to go back to your normal tension. If you try to keep everything tight, that's not going to fix that issue. You're just gonna have tight stitches that are not moving across your needle. And it's not gonna help your issue here if everything else is tightened up as well. You only need to tighten up what's happening between these two stitches. So it's important. I know that was one of the first things I did. I was trying to tighten everything, which didn't help at all because it was only of these two stitches that were the problem. So we come to that stitch, we bring it to the front and we tighten it up a little and then we can purl about keeping that yarn tight and then go back to your normal tension. And if that doesn't work, another thing you can do is wrap the yarn in a different direction because when you're coming to the front, obviously it's taking more yarn. But in a normal purl, we come up like this, and that takes more yarn. But if you wrap it this way, it takes less yarn. Let me show you that again. So a normal purl, we come in, we wrap it over the needle to the back. And you can see already that's a lot of yarn right there. But we can take out some of that yarn by doing that same thing. We tighten up on that knit stitch, but then we come from under the needle and over and that's even less yarn in that one. But what happens on the other side, if you're wrapping it that way, you have to pay attention because when you come back to that knit stitch on this side, you'll see that it's mounted differently. Usually in a standard Western mounted stitch, the right leg would be on the front and not on the back. You can see the difference between the two stitches right there. Now this one, so you've got that leg in the back. So if you've twisted your, if you've worked your yarn in the opposite direction on that purl row, all you need to do is knit it through the back leg on the next row to maintain the stitch mount. Those fixes generally work for most people, but I found for myself, I was still getting stitches that, they were still enlarged or they started, I think I was pulling too tightly and then my stitches would sort of have a zig and a zag motion across that one column. So I ended up like just sitting and watching my movements as I was knitting. You could also um, record your hands while you're, while you're knitting and just try to knit as relaxed as possible. Do some rib, nip two purl two rib um, to see exactly what you're doing because sometimes there's a movement that you're you're doing with your hands that can also cause this problem and i found that with my my knitting i'm going to back up a few stitches here so you can see um i would knit my my knits normally but then when i would come to the front to purl i would make the purl stitch and then i would pull down on the yarn so my purls were actually tighter than my knits because I wasn't pulling on that yarn. When I knit, I was just going like that and wrapping it around and wrapping it. Oops. But then when I would purl, I would wrap it around and then pull. And that was what was causing those large knit stitches and tight purl stitches. So those fixes helped, helped me figure out the problem. But I also, let me get back here. No, oh, I also discovered through just watching my own hands, the things that I was causing to make the problem worse. So you can do the fixes, but you also have to pay attention to what you, how you actually knit yourself. If you knit with your right hand, do you, are you really loose when you're bringing that yarn to the front? Do you need to pull tighter? That's probably going to help you right there. But if you have the opposite problem where you knit fairly normal with the knit stitch, but then when you come to that purl, you tighten things up then that knit stitch is still large and your pearls are too small and that just makes it look worse in the long run. So that's the, the best advice I can give is you can try these fixes, but really watch your hands as you're creating your stitches and just see what they're doing and see if there's something you're doing that can be adjusted. I didn't have to adjust my knit stitches to do this, but when I purl, I try to remind myself not to pull down and tighten that yarn. And that seems to help. And I can still use those little fixes where I can tug after that knit stitch to tighten it up because that's what's loose and then keep it tight while I work that first purl. But then after that, don't tug on the other purl stitches and things look a lot better when I try to do that. So that's the best thing you can do. Watch your own hands, see what you're doing 
that you could adjust to make that pearl knit to pearl transition a little smoother. There, I hope that was helpful. Oh, and yes, that one more, I had one more note on there. Another common thing is people pull this, the needles far apart when they're switching, when they're bringing that yarn to the front, they also pull the right and the left needle far apart and that can add excess yarn and stretch that area out as well. So try to work on the tips of the needles and keep your needles close together when you're making that transition and that can help keep those stitches smoother and tighter. Okay, so that addresses our questions of the week. We only had the one, but it was a good one for sure and something that a lot of knitters have trouble with. So we're going to jump right to our presentation. We're going to look at saddle shoulder sweaters and then we're going to look at dolman sleeves on a sweater as well. <clears throat> so we have covered lots of different ways that sweaters can be knit, seamless yoke, raglan, set and sleeve, drop or modified drop shoulder. Those are very the most common ways you'll see sweaters, but they can be knit a few other ways as well. And I'm sure we haven't covered them all. If I looked, I bet we'd find some other ways that sleeves can be attached to a sweater. And all of these construction methods, you can knit them from the bottom up, you can knit them from the top down, you can work them seamlessly in either direction, or you can work them in pieces and seam them together. And saddle shoulder sweaters surprisingly are no different my first introduction to them i just assumed that you use them when you want to work your sweater in pieces and seam it up but that is not necessarily the case you can use saddle shoulders in other ways as well so we're going to look at those right now but first is that basic um this is what it looks like the sleeve itself is where you'll see that little what they called the saddle is that little piece of fabric that sits right on the shoulder and it connects the front and the back of your sweater and it's attached to the sleeve and like I said before this can be worked in either direction it can be worked seamed and it can also be worked seamlessly you'll most often see it worked in seam or it's a commonly worked in seamed sweaters where the front and the back and the sleeves are worked in pieces like the sweater that I'm working on right now. This is exactly how I'm working on it. I'm going to work on the back and the front and then create the sleeves and seam them up. And that saddle connects the front and the back shoulders. And it works really well when you're not sure if your pattern on the front and the back is going to match up or if you really want to do like some sort of decorative element up the sleeve right to the shoulder which I'm going to be putting a cable along that, that spot right there too. And that will break up the front and the back. And it also adds a little more fabric and makes the neckline easier to create. For my, my sweater, I'm going to be using a two inch saddle. So I have subtracted an inch for the length from the front and the back both of the sweater to, to accommodate that saddle. And that will also like fill in around the neckline area as well. <clears throat> But you can also knit these seamlessly from the top down. Carol Feller has a really great tutorial about this that walks through the process of creating them. You create those two little bits of fabric for the right and the left saddle, and then you um, pick up stitches and work the back neckline and create the back of the sweater and repeat that for the front, and then you can continue working the rest of the sweater from that point. You'll find this link, the link that's right there on the screen. It's also down in the video description box if you want to go look more closely at this method. And you can also work them seamlessly from the bottom up. This is one of the methods that Elizabeth Zimmerman explains in her book, Knitting Without Tears. And there's a bit of an explanation on Brooklyn Tweed's blog um, where you can, he shows an example of using that method. Now you work the body and the sleeve separately in the round and then you join them all together just as you would like if you're going to work a circular yoke sweater from the bottom up or a raglan from the bottom up. And then this one is sort of a combination of raglan shaping and then the saddles at the top. So it's more of a seam, it's like a hybrid sweater. And just you can check out that link for a more detailed explanation of that process. Now let's look at a few, oh I should say that saddle shoulders can be used with three different um, construction methods. Let me go back right here. Um, 
You'll most often see them in drop shoulder sweaters where the the seam isn't sitting right on the this the shoulder. It's sort of off on the arm somewhere. So you'll see shoulder saddle shoulders on that. But you can also see them on cap or set in sleeves where the sleeves are sitting on the shoulders. And you can also see them like we showed with this picture right here, how it's shaped but with raglan shaping. So saddles can be added to very uh, lots of different types of sleeve constructions. And here are a few examples. Now this first one, Viminal by Carol Feller, this one is a top down. That article that she explains the process, this is the sweater that she showcases there where the, the two saddles are, are knit first, just the little piece on the shoulder. And then she uses that, she connects them across the back neck and creates the back and then the front. And then she has a set and sleeve shaping that she uses and works right from the top down. So it is a little more involved, like working in pieces, you're just knitting one square of fabric. My sweater is basically one rectangle and the front will be another rectangle with some simple shaping for the neckline. And then the two sleeves will help put it all together and that saddle will help adjust things along the shoulders. So it's very simple shaping, but when you get into this top down, it does take a little more finessing. You've got to create the separate pieces and combine them. And then that, that is the second one. The bottom up seamed is the new release by Brooklyn Tweed Saddler. It's worked in pieces and then you seam all of the pieces together, but it can also be done bottom up seamlessly. That last sweater is Jetty. This one's worked in the round from the bottom up. Um, and it's more of like a fisherman's gansey. It has that feel and look. The pieces are joined, the, the body and the sleeves. And then the yoke and the shoulders are worked together. And you can see it has a drop shoulder sleeve with that saddle in there. So we've got some different examples of how saddle shoulders can be used in different designs here. They can also be used in cardigans as well. We have another Carol Feller design here, her Woodburn cardigan. Now this one is worked up from the bottom up and this uses that uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman method of seamless construction. And then the second one, um, Don't Ask by Isabel Kramer. This is another top-down seamless. This uses what she calls a modified version of the contiguous set-in sleeve method developed by Susie Myers. I'm not sure what that method is. I'm not familiar with it myself, but this is another way of using um, saddle shoulder shaping to create a top-down sweater. And then the last one here from Cascade Yarns, this one is worked in pieces, the back, the two front pieces and the sleeves are worked and they are seamed together. That one's a free pattern. So if you just wanna go see what this construction is like, then you can go right over and see what that looks like. Now that's it for saddle shoulder shaping, but we're gonna dive into one more that um, is pretty popular in a variety of ways. And this is the dolman sleeve construction. I'm wearing one right now. Let me see if I can get my arm up there where the sleeve is integrated. I knit the body and then right where the sleeve is created, you just cast on extra stitches and the sleeves are part of the shape of the sweater itself. They're not, um, they can be knit separately and added on, but that, that when if you think of like that 80s bat wing style sweater, then that's a dolman sleeve construction. So well, at least with the sweater I'm wearing, I started at the bottom and I knit it up. And then when I got to where the sleeves were going to be, I, over the course of a few rows, I cast on stitches to give me the length of the sleeves and that little graduated dolman shaping. The picture here shows more of a bat wing where you've got a lot of increases work to create the really lots of fabric under the arm right there. But like other methods, these can be worked in pieces. The one I'm wearing was worked front and back and then the pieces were seamed together. It can be worked um, seamlessly from the top down, but it can also be worked seamlessly from the bottom up, like from the front hem to the back hem in one piece. I say seamless, but you do have to seam the sides in that case. Or so instead of seamless, I should say it's in one piece. You can work from front to back in one piece, or you can work from one cuff to the other cuff 
in one piece. So let's take a closer look at those. Okay, there's our, the first one, the one I'm wearing right now. You work it in pieces, knit from the bottom up, but you can knit them from the top down, and then you block the pieces and you seam the sides together. And it's very simple because there's the sleeves are attached already because they are just one piece. You've got your front and your back with this, the sleeves are sort of integrated. So it's just the one seam along both sides. But you can also work them from the top down. This example from Brooklyn Tweed, the upper body is worked flat and then you join to work in the round to the hem. And then you can see that sleeves are picked up and added so they can have longer sleeves, but it has more of that dramatic bat wing shaping. Now this is where it gets really interesting. You can knit them. I had this written as seamless, but I realized it's not seamless because you do have to seam up the sides, but it's more of a one piece construction. You're knitting the whole sweater in one piece. Um, for that first one, you're starting at the hem of the sweater and then you're working the front body. You're casting on for the sleeves and you're working across the sleeves and then you're binding off or decreasing for the neck and you might have to work each side separately at this point and then you increase or cast on for the back neck and then you continue working and binding off for the sleeves and work right down to the hem all in one piece you've got the whole sweater sitting on your lap as you knit this and then obviously when you're finished you would put the front and the back together and seam right up the side and the sleeve and then you can finish off the ripping along the the hem or the neckline and you can change the direction of knitting but and start at a cuff instead. So say you start at the right cuff, you would knit from the cuff to the shoulder and then you would start along the body and then you would bind off for the neck at that point and then you would probably have to work the front and the back separately and then cast on for the other side after the neck is complete and then bind off at the sleeve, um, bind off those body stitches and then finish knitting that other sleeve down to the cuff and then seam from that position. So these are really interesting ways to construct a sweater. I have not knit one of these. I think I'm going to put one on my list though because it seems like it would be very interesting. And here are a few examples of these dolman type sleeves. The first is Beyond the Dunes and this is that top down seamless. And then we have another top down, but this one is seamed. So the pieces are worked separately and then you are knitting them together or seaming them together. And then we have the bottom up seamed where the front and back are worked separately from the bottom up. They're joined at the shoulder and then sleeve stitches are picked up and worked uh, from there down to the wrist. And then a few examples of that contiguous design. The first one, uh, the seamless from side to side. Now this is another free pattern. So if you're interested in seeing how this construction works in a pattern, you can go to Yarnspirations and look for this pattern. You'll find the link down below. Now this one is worked from the right cuff to the shoulder and then you divide for the neck opening and then you join the back and the front again to work from shoulder to the left cuff. And then you add ribbing to the front and the back and seam along the, the hem all the way up to the underarm and down to the, the, the wrist. And then you pick up stitches for the neckband. And then this other example from Interweave, I really like the collar on this one, that design. It reminds me of something like of a Audrey Hepburn style with that stand-up collar. Um, this one is worked back and forth in one piece. You start at the lower front and you work to the underarm. Then you cast on sleeves for the stitches, or you cast on stitches for the sleeves. Then the sleeves in the body are worked from the shoulders to the back and the sleeve stitches are bound off at the underarm and the back is worked to the lower edge. So that's another example of one not seamless, but a sweater that's knit in one piece and then seamed. So that was all we had for um, to talk about today. That was our presentation and our only knitting question. If you have a question you'd like to talk about, you can drop it right in the chat and we can talk about it right now. And while we're waiting for any questions, if you want to um, answer our community question of the week, you'll find it linked down below.
or you can leave your comment right in the chat right here. If you're a sock knitter, which way do you prefer to knit your socks? Do you like to start at the cuff and work down to the toe? Or do you like to work at the toe and work up to the cuff? I like both methods. It depends on that. Sometimes it's the design that tells me um, I might see a particular knitting pattern that I really want to knit. And it doesn't matter which way it's knit. I just want to knit them. But if I just have some yarn laying around and I'm casting on a pair for myself, just a basic rib or stockinette, then I usually start at the toe because I'll divide the yarn into two balls right away because I have like nine, nine and a half feet and they're wide. So I wanna make sure I have enough yarn to knit the pair of socks. So if I start at the, the top and work the cuff first, I might not have enough to finish the second sock. So personal preference, if I'm not sure I'm gonna have enough yarn, then I will start at the toe and work up and make sure I have enough, at least for like some shorty socks, which actually I prefer to wear most often. I don't like really high socks. If you want to tell me what kind of socks you like to knit, then you can pop that. You can pop that in the chat or go over and answer on the poll and see what everybody else has to say. And before we wrap up, if you have uh, if you need more knitting help, if you have a specific technique you'd like to learn more about, or if you're really struggling with a pattern and you need some help, then I have a knitting 911 page. You can hop right over to Tanya Knits and see more about that. Or if you need help learning how to read your stitches, you can check out that free guide. And it doesn't look like we have any more questions today. So I will just wrap up and say thank you for joining me today. And I do have one final request. If you have some topics you'd like to discuss in a future podcast live streams, then please let me know about it. Now that we've wrapped up our sweater construction, I'm looking for some new topics that we can talk about during this live stream where we answer your knitting questions. So if you have an idea for that, then please leave me a comment and tell me about it. And that is it for this week. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Knitting 411, where we answer your knitting questions. And we will see you again in two weeks. So, so until then, get something on your knitting needles and start knitting.